everybody. Welcome to Casing the Joint, brought to you by the Boyertown Museum of Historic Vehicles. I'm Kendra. I'm Dan. And here on Casing the Joint, we like to take a look at some of the smaller items in the collection. Maybe the ones that get overshadowed a bit or they're sitting in a case. Uh, or sometimes even their extra kind of like set dressing on the cars or in the cars. Or it's maybe a piece of artwork that we put up on the wall somewhere. And that's what we're talking about today. We're up on the... Um, up on the modified easel, easel here. Yes. <laughs> so today we're looking at this. This We have this framed. This is an advertisement for Fisk Red Top Tires. Um, and this was in Life magazine. You can see the Life logo at the top. Uh, and some of this text, it reads, the Fisk Red Top combines distinctive appearance and tire efficiency in the highest degree. It is the final touch to the perfectly appointed car. Ooh. And it has all these little critters. I can't, it looks like the car, they're, they're crossing the road after the car has passed yeah. to me. Or maybe the car's in reverse, I don't know. But they're all, you know, some of them are wearing like coats and vests and that one guy's carrying an umbrella. But anyway, um, before we get a little more on this ad, let's talk about Fisk Tires a bit. So the Fisk Tire Company uh, was in Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. I've heard of that place before. Yeah, I see Massachusetts a lot in the early days of the Is that where the Duryeas were I from? I do believe that the Duryeas were there. It's close to Springfield, which had a lot of stuff going on as well. Mm. So um, it actually started originally in 1898 as the Spalding and Pepper Company. Spalding. Yeah, not Spalding like... Baseballs. Yeah, there's a U in there. S-P-A-U. So they made bicycle tires. Um, but Noyes Fisk bought it and, I'm sorry, he bought the Spalding and Pepper Company in 1898. What, what was his first name? Noyes, I think. Noyes. Noyes. N-O-Y-E-S. Wow. Okay. It's an odd name, isn't it? I heard that as a last name hmm. and it's pronounced Noyes. So that's what I'm going with. <laughs> sorry, he bought it in 1898 and renamed it the Fisk rubber company and they were a big producer i got this cool um, uh, factory postcard you'll see up on your screen there which i like 29 acres tires only it's a lot of 29 acres it's a lot of acres of tires being made um and huge, they huge factory huge yes. factory i like this one because it's nighttime and i don't see that a lot right i'm assuming it's supposed to be nighttime um so they were a huge producer of tires. They would later open plants in Jewett City, Connecticut, New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, there's a cool factory photo inside from the 20s of a guy working there. Um, and in the 1920s, they were, the Chicopee plant alone was making 5,000 tires a day. So that's a lot. And that was just is. one factory mm -hmm. that they had. So they were a really big uh, name in tires in the beginning. However, uh, in the 30s, the Great Depression really hurt them, uh, as well as the DuPont family started to get into tires with another company. And the DuPonts have lots of money. So mm -hmm. that didn't bode well for them. In, in 1930, they had 121 retail stores. In 1934, they were down to three. So it was what, what, what hard was those and fall numbers fast. Again? Go, go 121 them. retail stores in 1930. 30, okay. And in 34, they were down to three. Four years. Okay. So that's pretty quick it <laughs> downfall, is. really. Yes. Uh, they were purchased by United States Rubber in 1940, later Uniroyal. So I think they were maybe using the name a little bit too, but they're not the Fisk that they once were. Hmm. I'm going to interrupt you here. Yeah. Is that okay? Of course. You're too young for this, but there was a TV um, advertising thing by Uniroyal Tires. Okay. Back 1970s, maybe. And there was three people, Uni, Roy, and Al. And they were in a <laughs> thing, and they did this advertising. You know I, I have to go find it now. I think they were supposed to be stunt drivers, I think. 
Am I right, audience? <laughs> okay. And Uni was was a lady, I guess short okay. for Eunice. Oh, and then there was sorry. Roy and Al. So You know I have to go find oh, that on YouTube yeah. now. And then if I find it, I'll post it on Facebook because that's funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, this has nothing to do with anything, but it's cool and it's sports stuff and I knew you'd appreciate it. Um, and I had to show these photos. So here you'll see from 1919, the Fisk Red Top Baseball Team. Ooh. Yeah, I knew you'd like that. Here, take a look at that. Isn't that great? It is. You can see Fisk uh, on their jerseys. And then the next photo there is from 1920, the American Industrial Basketball Champions, the Fisk team. So hmm. they won five straight games within 24 hours in the Industrial Basketball Championship Tournament in Akron, Ohio. Wow. I know. I got to find out more about this. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, so basically, you know, the baseball team, at least when I read that, it was like, what did they use the word? Like a social club in the plant mm -hmm. sort of. And I've mm -hmm. seen that uh, a few episodes ago. We talked about Firestone and they, in their newsletter, they talk about how they have like social clubs there for, mm -hmm. you know, sports, but also like the women had like a quilting club and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know there were like, there's some organized championship tournament, which is cool. So I, I that remember sounds um, like a future segment. I remember sometime. somebody sending me a picture of the baseball team for the Dodge Brothers. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Do we know who that is? I Doug? have a guess. Doug? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think there was a baseball team here where Tom Body had it wouldn't one. Surprise but me. you know, that was probably just local because this wasn't a, a huge company. Well, and it's funny because I know like uh, Babe Ruth played for the Bethlehem Steel Plant team out of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, wow. which is cool. Well, I didn't know that. And if you go to their histor their museum, the historical site has a museum out there, you'll see like photos of the team and Babe Ruth is in there. Hmm. And like, that's neat. But maybe there was more organized, apparently, yeah. championships and tournaments. I thought it was kind of like a pickup thing, like yeah. Sunday afternoons we go play this. So. Stay hmm. tuned. I got to dig more into that because that's really yep. cool. It's your homework. That's right. So um, you actually may know Fisk tires be through their most famous advertising slogan and image, and that's the time to retire boy, uh, which you'll see there on the screen. So he's got his arm around the tire and the other hand is holding the little candle. Um, and they started using this in 1910 and they used it pretty much all the way to the end. I mean, that was their slogan for decades, and that right. little boy. And he's yawning there. And he's yawning. It's a good ad. Oh, it's I wonderful. Mean, and actually, most ads, even if the main artwork is not the, the boy, you'll still see it like in the corner or something. This one doesn't have it. I don't really know why. But When, when I was a kid, um, mm -hmm. we used to get our, our gas for our car. Uh, at Gombas Sunoco in Middlesex, New Jersey. That, besides the point, across the street was a repair place, and yeah. they had a statue of this oh, little boy, yes. and it must have been six, eight feet high. And yeah. you know, as a little kid, I didn't know what it was. Uh, yeah. You know, but that was interesting. And I got older. I, I had a friend who was from that town, and he said, like every year, that statue ended up inside the lobby of their high school. Yeah, you know, as a prank. The prank. <laughs> yeah, which was like right around the corner. So. Okay. That's good. But you're right, it wasn't just the ads. I mean, they had huge signs mm -hmm. on the side of buildings with him, statues. And so that was their big mm -hmm. advertising and it's, thing. It's and clever. And it is. to retire. Yeah. You know? And in 1930, they, they like refreshed him a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like they made him, I think he looks a little more chipper. chipper. Not as sleepy as <laughs> he's yawning in this one, but... Um, they use that pretty much their whole life, Fisk Tire. Why are they red, though? Like, what's, I couldn't really find, is that just a looks thing? Do you know? Oh, the Fisk I, tire. I thought, well, I why thought are you were so, going to tell me. No, I'm not. I tried to figure it out. But it looks like everything I see when they advertise the red tops, mm -hmm. it's like, it's distinct. There's nothing mm -hmm. about it actually being a better product, mm -hmm. necessarily. It's well, about I, distinction. And I, I've seen now, now you can see this. These are like white sidewalls mm -hmm. with the red tread on it. And I've seen them. I've seen old advertising with 
red sidewalls with the black tread, you know, same amount of, of space covered. And I've also seen them um, back in that same era, advertisements for inner tubes, talking about red inner tubes. And I'm thinking, oh, was wow. this, you know, maybe was it just advertising and red was the only color they could mix with the rubber besides black and white? Or, and you know, and reds are color, like, you know, yeah. it's, that's our distinctive thing yeah. that we do. And, but, but yeah, like every ad doesn't say, you know, the red means that the process was different and it makes mm -hmm. a better tire. It's all about, it's distinctive and it's yeah. for the finest cars. So my thinking is it's really a looks thing. Mm -hmm. Like a, a, brand, a branding thing, that's, you know? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. But I've seen yeah. it with different other businesses, other right. tire companies. Right. So, hmm. It was so good. They called their sports teams the Red Tops. Okay. You know, I mean, that, ba that baseball and basketball team were the Fisk Red Tops. That's mm -hmm. what they called them. But, but back to this ad. I just had a thought here. Uh-oh. There's a pizza shop down near Limerick and they have the pizzas and they call it the red top home of the red top field trip yeah <laughs> yeah okay so hurry up okay. time for lunch all right i know i'm okay. hungry now especially now i think it's called jenny's is the name of the pizza jenny's place. red tops no well, jenny's pizza is a red top yeah yeah okay well when you dan actually showed me this ad and tipped me off to this so we have this little, all this artwork here and these little cute animals running around and, you know, they're all very expressive too. Like they're, they're just cute. But there's this, there's a signature down here of Harrison Cady. And you're the one that said you should look him up. It was suggested to me and I did and it was fun. I, it was a fun little trip I, I knew to find out about fun. I did yeah. so who is Harrison Katie well there's a photo of him there you can see um, Harrison Katie was born in 1877 in Gardner Massachusetts more Massachusetts mm -hmm. people um, he died in 1970 um, and if you go online and search for him you will get countless illustrations that he did. He was quite prolific. Um, his professional art career started in 1894. So he's only 17, which is pretty neat. That's because that year he appeared in an issue of Harper's Young People, which was a children's magazine. There's a, a cover of one. So when I say Harper's Young People, it's the same uh, company that did Harper's Bazaar and Harper's Weekly. This was their children's magazine that they did. So, um, you know, stories for younger audience, kids' stories. I've seen a couple of books from this time period where, you know, it has the title and then underneath it says, as begun in Harper's Young People. Hmm. You know, they had those like serial type mm -hmm. stories where you have to get every issue to get the next chapter or whatever. And then you'll get, you can go out and buy the book because you read the first five and you really like them and you want to see how it ends. So um, that was his first professional uh, piece that was, that was published. And he would go on to work for Life Magazine under John Ames Mitchell, who founded Life Magazine, hmm. he started it. He was one of its first artists that worked there. So he's published in a lot of periodicals. Some of these I don't even recognize, like St. Nicholas Magazine, no idea. Boys Life, the Saturday Evening Post, Ladies Home Journal, Good Housekeeping, all this stuff. Here's um, a 1928 cover that he did for People's Home Journal. We had to include that one because it has a vehicle. These little critters. It's the same animals. Speeding down on a sleigh. The animals are very similar, yes. That's a guy. Yeah, yeah. He really likes animals. A little knit hat on the ears. See that? It's adorable. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't notice the knit hat on the rabbit ears. That's hilarious. Some of them are different lengths too. There's like the short ones and some, it's too funny. Okay. He was, he was actually, he was a big conservationist. So I think that's another reason he mm -hmm. like, he kind of drifted toward animals a lot. Um, but 
Uh, he did quite a few illustrations for books as well. So here's one uh, from a series called Queen Silverbell, and it was a book series by Frances Hodgson Burnett. There's a fairy trapped in a cage from Queen Silverbell. Um, he also, in addition to illustrating other people's books, he did write and illustrate his own books as well. This series was called Butternut Hill. And I got the cover there of the one. Jack Frost arrives on Butternut Hill. Again, same type of little critters, you know, little woodland creatures dressed up. But his most famous works um, were illustrations for Thornton, Thornton Burgess's Peter Cottontail and Peter Rabbit stories. So there's uh, another photo there of Cottontail, um, Peter Cottontail, the book cover. That rabbit looks really close to this rabbit here. So I like to think that that's good old Peter Cottontail or Peter Rabbit there. Um, now Harris and Katie did not do illustrations for Beatrix Potter's Peter Rabbit. So she did her own so illustrations. So Peter Cottontail. Well, sort of, yes. Uh -oh. So Beatrix Potter came, or her book, The Tale of Peter Rabbit, came out in 1902. And that was her book, her illustrations. Um, however, other authors kind of co-opted the Peter Rabbit character, like Thornton Burgess. And copyright laws weren't quite what they are today. And uh, he okay. used the Peter Rabbit name, Peter Cottontail. So he had a comic strip called the Adventure, you know, Peter Rabbit um, uh, comic strip, which would be in your newspaper. That appeared in 1920 in the New York Herald Tribune is the first uh, Peter Cottontail comic strip, which uh, you'll see an image of that up on your screen. What a busy a, image. Oh, yeah, I'll get to that. That's, there's also oh. another one here, we're going to throw up here, call, you know what that's called? No. That's, that's a Peter Rabbit cartoon. It's called The Boisterous Barbecue. It looks boisterous. I'm a little disturbed that there's a pig sitting at the table, I think. Two of them. Yeah, that's a little scary. So, <laughs> so you know, when you think of Peter Rabbit, and we all think of Beatrix Potter, we probably do think a lot about her illustrations. His are a little, to me, they're a little more cartoony, which makes sense because it was more um, for a comic strip it started and then um, books that were sold over here. Um, and she, she fought some people later um, for using the Peter Rabbit name, but she never went after Thornton Burgess. I don't really know why and... I don't know. It's interesting. Um, and some of them she won, you know, they couldn't use her character without um, acknowledging her. The Peter Cottontail thing comes from the comic strip where apparently for a couple months, Peter Rabbit decided that his name was too plain. So he decided to go by Peter Cottontail and he would put on airs about how... Hmm. Uh, it was like a storyline, how important he was, mm -hmm. and it, it caught up to him eventually, and he went back to being Peter Rabbit. So that's why the Peter Rabbit, Peter Cottontail, it's the same character, but it's not Beatrix Potter's version of the character. Mm. It's very confusing. But uh, Thornton Burgess, that comic, I should say, also started in 1920, and it went to 1948. So it was a long-running strip, and... Um, Harrison Katie here did all the illustrations for it. Burgess wrote the text, came up with the storylines. Uh, and Burgess would later write, I like to think that Miss Potter gave Peter a name known the world over, while I, with Mr. Katie's help, perhaps made him a character. So he probably, okay. they had a lot to do with popularizing him, I guess, over here in the United States, because Beatrix Potter is English. And uh, hmm. over there it was quite popular. And I think they kind of had an influence with 
bringing the character over to the U.S. So, and then, um, so you all have to go find some old Peter Rabbit comics and see if some of these other critters in here are characters, because I'm convinced that that's him. Maybe that's him in his Peter Cottontail, you know, fancy ways, because his coat looks kind of fancy there, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The red and the black cuffs with the brass buttons. I think he's looking pretty fancy, but... Um, <clears throat> this is just one of those neat things and uh, if you like I said if you go online and Google Harrison Katie you will find a lot of stuff that he did and it's very much in this style he likes his little critters dressed up yeah so Harrison Katie is he any relation to Frank Katie I wish but I found no evidence of such. And who would be Frank Cady? Or, yeah, I Frank hope Katie. that our visitor, our viewers know that Frank Cady is Sam Drucker from Hooterville. Yes, Green Acres. Green Acres. Petticoat Junction. Do you know he's also oh. in Rear Window, the Alfred Hitchcock movie, with Jimmy Stewart when he has, you know, his broken leg and he's looking at the apartments. No. It's like his spine. So I he's, the, he's okay. one of the neighbors. He's the one who, him and his wife drag a mattress out to their fire escape and sleep on the fire escape. Okay. I don't think he has any lines. He's, because he's one of the people that Jimmy okay. Stewart's is watching. But next time you tune into Rear Window, look for Frank Katie. Sam Drucker. Sam Drucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's my parlor trivia for the day. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone for joining us here on Casing the Joint. Next time you stop in the museum, uh, look for this week. We'll have it hanging up somewhere. You better. We will. This is it's, just a neat, it is neat really advertisement. Neat. It is really neat. And a reminder that even the little things like this have some cool history behind them. So uh, thanks, everyone, and we will see you next time.